Today I'd like to give you a flavor of the current state of the art practice of neurosurgery. I'd like to give you a little glimpse into the future of neurosurgery, which we're going to see in the next 10 years. And then I'd like to, in talking this forum, give you a little bit of ideas on how you can explore the space of medicine in your, in your shoes and try to figure out how, if, if it's a field for you, what you can do in, your, in this time. So what I'd like to start with is I'd like to start with a couple cases, a couple situations, and review a little about what we do in, in these particular cases. So a 17-year-old comes to the emergency room, and uh, they're not responsive. This young man's not responsive, not talking, not really moving anything, not able to follow commands. And this person can't move part of their body, half their body. It's a very serious problem. So uh, the person gets a CT scan and the emergency doctor gives me a call and uh, this is an example of a CT scan. CT scan of the head. And on the, this side of the image you can see uh, there is a blood clot pushing on the brain. And, and this is a very serious problem. It's a very, uh, it could be a lethal problem. But fortunately, there are ways of treating this. This is something that actually that we've been doing for decades, over 40 years on how to treat this problem. And this, the solution is actually a straightforward one that you would imagine. You essentially have to take out the space occupying lesion. So that's what we have done for the last several decades, and that's what we continue to do. And it's still the state of the art practice. We remove the blood clot, and we give the brain time to heal. Here's an image of what happens afterwards. So you see an image reconstruction of the brain on the CT scan afterwards, and you can see the skull and plates holding the skull back in place, and it'll grow over. And you see the brain afterwards, how the clot has been removed. And we've created an optimal environment, a healthy environment for the brain to recover and heal. The practice of this hasn't changed in the last several decades. Here's a second case, another example. It's a college student who's used in a normal state of health. And this college student was having a good weekend, and they started noticing he had some neck pain in the back of his neck. This started getting a little bit worse over the course of the week, and uh, then the, the students started having some uh, fevers. Went to the doctor, started getting worked up for this, started getting x-rays, and just general physical therapy and things like that. But then quickly the patient, the, the kid started noticing that he couldn't use his arm, arms or legs very well anymore. And that prompted really a quick evaluation to try to figure out what was going on. And it turns out the person had an infection, an infection in their spine. Another serious problem. And, uh, and so then this is where we were called, that was called. What we had to do was remove the infection, to take out the infected vertebra and remove the vertebra, remove the area that was infected and make room for the spinal cord. To again, give more room for the spinal cord so it could have a good environment, a good area to heal and recover on its own. And that's what we did. And so what we did was we replaced, at least in this current state of the art practice, you remove the infected infection, replace it with cage and screws, reconstruct the spine and make a good environment for the spinal cord. There's a key problem with all this. Is even though the technology is advanced, it changes every year, and the practice changes every year, things are never the same as they were 10 years ago. And the problem is, is that in both of these cases, there, there is a limited amount of recovery a person will make. We can reconstruct the spine, we can make room for the spine, we can make room for the brain, we can make, create a good environment for the brain and the spinal cord to recover, but we can't make nerves regrow quite yet. We can't, uh, make, uh, we can't make the body heal itself faster in many cases, we just have to give it time to heal. Is that the way it's going to be in 10 years? Absolutely not. And that's what's exciting about medicine. That's what's exciting about the health sciences. What, the way I practice today will not be the way I practice in even five years. So there is hope and there's an exciting part of this field that I would like to relay to you and I would like to make sure you know about because the, what you learn, how things you are learning now and things you are learning in the next 10 to 20 years will not be the way it's going to be in 30 years. So it's constantly a field that's evolving and changing. Medicine and science are very affected by technology and innovation. Things, simple things like you think about, like an iPhone or a smart technology like that, really changes the way we practice medicine.
here's an image of the way things are moving forward for those two particular types of patients. So in those patients, they have, after they were treated with state-of-the-art medicine, they still have part of their body they cannot move. They're paralyzed on part of their body. So half their body doesn't work. So the way we bypass it now is with something called the brain-machine interface, something that's on the forefront of treatments. So, so here is a image of a brain with a reconstructed image of a brain with a diagram of a grid that can be placed over the brain. And that grid can be laid on the surface of the brain and can record electrical signals on the brain. There's a real life image of an example of these types of electrodes sitting on the surface of the brain. And these, these electrodes can be implanted and secured on there, kept there, and then you can record the signals from the brain. The signals can go to a computer and then you can develop a brain computer interface which will learn, learn the recordings, learn how the person thinks when they want to move their arm. And you could either directly control muscles through another interface or control a robotic arm. This is not science fiction. This is something that's actually happening in reality. This is something that is going on in clinical trials currently throughout the United States. Here's an image of a, a patient, a, sub, a, control, a subject who is, has an injury and can't move their arms and legs. But they are now, with this brain-machine interface, in a clinical trial, controlling this computer, just with their mind. That's what's exciting about medicine and science, because day-to-day -day science from the basic bench research end up treating patients in 10 to 20 years so that things that were devastating illnesses in the past can be treated. This isn't just limited, this idea of innovation in medicine isn't just limited to neurosurgery or neuroscience. A perfect example is a single drug that came out three years ago that has completely changed the field of infectious disease. That, that drug has really changed, many, both that and many drugs have changed many, many uh, aspects of medicine. So for example, here we have a uh, image of a, uh, an electrode that goes into the brain to treat a disease called Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is a movement disorder that affects the elderly. And it typically causes a tremor in a person. And they can take medications, but there are certain groups of people that the medications don't work anymore. So we can place a specific tiny electrode that's less than a millimeter thick into a very targeted part of the brain, and that will treat Parkinson's disease. It treats it very well. In a similar circumstance, you can treat a form of epilepsy with similar technologies where you place an electrode targeted in a very specific part of the brain, and you can uh, uh, you can target that part of the brain and really reduce the amount of seizures they have and how intense they are. The advantage of that is that epilepsy is a devastating illness. It keeps the people from doing what they want. It reduces their lifespan. They're too scared to function in normal capacity because they don't know when they're going to have a seizure. If you can reduce their frequency of seizures by 50% with a simple device, then that is a major, major, uh, uh, major, major, uh, in, has major impact in medicine. What's another disease you treat? So an elderly person comes into the hospital, again in a coma, unresponsive, very common occurrence when they have, when they have a, something called a subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is where an aneurysm or a blister in a blood vessel ruptures. It causes blood to invade the brain. That's, patients will recover from that, but the problem with that situation is that aneurysm can rupture again, and it often does. 100 years ago, this was an untreatable problem. 50 years ago, this was an untreatable problem. But about 40 years ago, the surgical microscope was invented, and it allowed surgeons to really look into the brain and to really zoom in at a microscopic level and be able to see the aneurysm and treat the aneurysm with, with essentially what looks like a paper clip. So surgeons look through the microscope and they see this tiny view. And this instrument here is only a few millimeters thick. It's very small, but the surgeon can see that, find the aneurysm, and clip it prevent the aneurysm from re rupturing while the patient the person recovers. Even in the last decade, this has changed even further. Surgery for aneurysms is not that common anymore. Very rare. Because now what you can do is you can get a CT scan, you can find the aneurysm, and then you can treat the aneurysm from the inside, filling it with coils or metal. 
So the fields are constantly changing. Every aspect, and every, every field within even neurosurgery, every subspecialty is changing rapidly. Brain tumors. So brain tumors are very fairly common, and but and then most of the time they're very treatable. Traditionally, we treated brain tumors by making an incision in the scalp, removing the window of bone, and taking out the tumor. It's a good treatment for it, but it, the person stays in the hospital a week, take a long time to recover. Over the last decade, we've developed ways of treating this with more minimally invasive methods to be able to take it, remove brain tumors, or incinerate brain tumors from the inside. People go to the hospital with a brain tumor and they leave the next day. That's unheard of. But it's the reality. It's what's actually being practiced these days. So here's an image of a, of a, uh, of a special device that can be placed on the scalp and you can place a laser into the tumor and, and burn the tumor from the inside out. The field that I have really grown to love and fell in love with was spinal disorders and spinal cord injury, for example. A person comes into the spinal cord injury, it's the same situation as the first circumstances I was talking about. Some people do well, some people do not, and we just give the spinal cord time to heal. And I'm not, I'm not happy with that, so I've been really trying to work with scientists around WashU and other field and other areas to try to push the field further, to try to figure out how we can predict who does well with after spinal cord injury and how, to, how we can affect treatment and change the treatments. So one thing that we can do now is that if a person has a spinal cord injury, there's an image of their CT scan showing that they have a fracture and they have a spinal cord injury. Now what we can do is we can do some advanced neuroimaging of the brain to look at the architecture, and the structure and the uh, functional connectivity between the brain regions to study how the brain changes after a spinal cord injury. And by doing that, what we can do is we can try to predict outcome and find targets to treat. So for example, what we can do is we can get a, an MRI that looks at connectivity within the brain and we can ask what, how, does, if we, how does this area of the brain connect with the rest of the brain after a spinal cord injury. And what we find is that the parts of the brain that control your motor function become more connected with each other, and the parts of the brain that control sensation become more connected with each other. At the same time, parts of the brain that control motor function become less connected with sensation. And, and the same is true. So for example, if you look at the visual cortex, it becomes less connected with part of the brain that controls motor function. So all these things are, can be used to predict outcome, and we can basically be able to uh, understand how the brain changes and reorganizes over time. Use this to not only predict outcome, but also affect treatment. So all, as all these things are changing, and we're very excited about these changes, the one thing I want to talk to you a little about is how you can kind of get involved in, in this, and how you can explore the space. Because uh, as I'd like to explain to you, it's, it's so exciting, you will never be bored in this type of field or medicine in general because you'll constantly be, be exposed to new things and you'll constantly be exposed to new ways of doing things and you'll be pushing the field further yourself. So one way you can do it is you can just explore all the fields of medicine. Medicine, nursing, physical therapy, all the allied health fields, they all have uh, wonderful parts to them and they all take a different bent or view on treating patients. You can shadow doctors or family members, nurses, friends, uh, see how everyone does, because my practice, day-to-day -day practice, is different from another physician's or nurse's day-to-day -day practice, and see if that's something you want to do. You can volunteer. You can either volunteer at the hospital, or you can volunteer at the clinic. You're always need for volunteers to help take care of people. You won't be doing anything glamorous, but you'll get immersed in the field. You'll really get to know what's going on in the medical field. You can apply for summer research programs. As I've alluded to in this, research is the future of medicine. Research is what pushes the field forward so that we're not doing the same thing now that we'll be doing in 20 years. So getting involved in research is through university programs or summer programs is a great way of getting understanding of medicine and science. Finally, you can attend summer uh, medical programs. Uh, there are some medical programs throughout the country where you can uh, apply for them 
do some fundraising and go to these summer week, these week long summer programs. I did one when I was in high school, and they're they're a good way of learning and exploring the space and learning about medicine. These are all different ways you can kind of explore the field and explore the space while you're still in high school. Because the reality is that pursuing a life in medicine is a kind of a, once you finish high school and you're in the middle of college and thinking about this, it's a lifelong pursuit. It's not something you finish. You will be reading and studying your whole life and it will become part of who you are. But the best part is it's just very exciting. You'll never be bored. You'll always be doing something new. One day I'm doing an awake craniotomy, the next day I'm in the lab studying, the third day I'm, in, I'm doing spinal fusion. You're never bored. You're always doing something exciting. So I hope I've given you a little flavor and a little glimpse about the current state of the art treatment of medicine and surgery and uh, a little bit about what you can do to get involved and give you a little bit of excitement about the future treatments that are available, the ones in the forefront and the ones that you can develop in the distant future.